McDreamy. Don't McDreamy me. McDreamy is being a McAff. Grey's Anatomy's Derek Shepard may be known as McDreamy, but a lot of his behavior on Grey's Anatomy is actually pretty McCringy. You didn't tell me you were married. Okay, so now we're gonna have that fight again. At first glance, he comes off as an undeniably talented doctor with the Disney prince looks, irresistible charm, and admirable passion to earn his spot as an audience favorite. Show creator Shonda Rhimes even felt that she had no other choice but to kill the character off when actor Patrick Dempsey left the show in season 11, stating, I really couldn't have the idea that he just turned out to be a bad guy who walked out on his wife and kids be a true story. But in the years since his on-screen death, more fans have picked up on his shortcomings. He aggressively pursues an intern he has direct power over, doesn't tell her he's married, then slut shames her once they're broken up. You really get around. What did you just say to me? It's unforgivable. And that's only in the first two seasons. Returning in season 17 in Meredith's beach dream while she's in a coma suffering from COVID-19, this literal McDreamy is deeply supportive and in touch with Meredith's emotions. Your body's tired, but your soul, your soul won't even let me near you. You're still fighting. But is that romantic vision of him really accurate to the character he was when he was alive? Here's our take on Derek Shepard's less dreamy traits and what we can learn from his lack of growth. We are so excited to announce that we now have a line of Weird Girl merchandise. You can now express it through t-shirts, posters, mugs, a backpack. There's power in owning the Weird Girl in all of us. Announce that you are the Weird Girl. Click the link in the description below and get your hands on this one-of-a-kind Weird Girl merch. Derek is a manipulative partner. Yes, his marriage to Addison falls apart after she cheats on him, but his immature reaction prolongs both of their pain. He won't work on their relationship, but also refuses to formally end things, leaving them in limbo as a way to punish her. And he fails to recognize that before her infidelity, their marriage was lacking in affection and intimacy. Sometimes people do desperate things to attract attention. That's your side of this, that I didn't pay you enough attention. A problem that they both contributed to. We got successful, you and me. We got busy and we got lazy. We didn't even bother to fight anymore. He then starts a relationship with Meredith without telling her that he is still technically married. I'm Addison Shepard. Shepard? And you must be the woman who's been screwing my husband. The fallout causes him to end things with Meredith and give Addison another chance, in theory. But in reality, this takes the form of continuing to hurt Addison and relishing her suffering as karmic payback. You do not get to laugh and you do not Get to gloat. Why would I gloat? I have poison oak. So are we even yet? And is this bad enough? Have I repaid my debt to society? He also doesn't allow Meredith to move on. He slut shames her for sleeping with someone else. Who's next? Alex? Because I hear he likes to sleep around. You two have that in common. And even though he's rejected her, he gets openly jealous and competitive with her new partner and displays a feeling of ownership over her, acting as though she's doing something wrong by trying to be happy with another man. I'm married. I have responsibilities. She doesn't make me sick to my stomach thinking about my veterinarian touching her with his hands. His behavior in that situation reveals that he holds some pretty misogynistic views. Derek's criticisms and treatment of Meredith can feel notably gendered. In addition to judging her sex life while having an active one of his own, he uses language to characterize her as an over-emotional woman, casting himself as the calm and rational man. It would feel better if Meredith wasn't so, you know. She's acting silly about the credit. She's getting emotional. He makes decisions for Meredith and then informs her, instead of including her in the process. You can't just assume I'm gonna kick my family out. And you don't get to announce it to them and ambush me. He disregards Meredith's feelings, like when he assumes she'll jump for joy at his DC job offer, without predicting that she'll also be worried about how totally uprooting her life will affect her career and their children. My life is here. I don't want to leave. And when she's not willing to drop everything in Seattle, he harbors underlying resentment towards his wife for, in his eyes, limiting his career. I gave up everything for you. There it is, everything. You gave up everything. That was everything to you? So while he undoubtedly loves Meredith, on some level, it seems that he doesn't see theirs as a true marriage of equals because he clearly sees his career as more significant than hers. Do you believe that your career is more important than mine? At this moment in time, it is. No, not at this moment. 
always. Underlying this is an unexamined belief that a woman who loves him should unequivocally support him and sacrifice to accommodate his needs. And it's revealing that he considers being unfaithful to Meredith when he meets a woman who shows him the worshiping admiration he feels he deserves. This is amazing. You're amazing. Part of the problem with Meredith's and Derek's relationship is that it began with an inherently unequal power dynamic. When he, the talented neurosurgeon, fell for a young girl from the bar he soon found out was a new intern at the hospital. Stop looking at me like that. Like what? Like you've seen me naked. Dr. Shepard, this is inappropriate. He even exercises his authoritative power over her based on how their love life is going, displaying favoritism at work when they're happy. It's Dr. Gray. She's gonna prep you for the procedure and assist. And professionally reprimanding her when they're having romantic conflicts. You don't get to act like a spoiled little brat in my OR. This power dynamic continues after Meredith is promoted to Derek's level. You will always be that hotshot surgeon, and I will always be that young intern who fell in love with you. That's how you see yourself. That is that. not how I see myself. That is the issue here. He so routinely puts his partner's needs second. Have you even noticed that I went through a trauma too? That Christina has to remind Meredith to remember her own importance. Don't let what he wants eclipse what you need. It's not just in relationships, but in general, that Derek acts like the world revolves around him. A new method in treating inoperable malignant gliomas. The Shepherd method. What do you think? It's a picture, a big picture of you. He may be a kind and skilled doctor, but Derek's also selfish with an exaggerated sense of self-importance. This is partly because of how other people treat him. Oh, Derek got arrested again. Yes. Reckless endangerment. Please. Did he lose his license yet? Oh no, because they don't charge him because the cops worship him. He's glorified as the hotshot surgeon and patients and colleagues alike are drawn to his charismatic personality and good looks. He's hot and arrogant in a way that's still sexy. However, much like the popular cliche of surgeons as cowboys who assume they know everything, he's internalized that flattering view of himself to a harmful degree. He feels entitled to damage other people's careers to help his own, and berates those with a skill level he finds threatening to reestablish his sense of control. I get it. You were king of all neurosurgeons, right hand to the president, and now you can't have that. So you need to be king of the hospital and kick around the peons. He takes full credit for the groundbreaking clinical trial that he and Meredith both worked on, diminishing her accomplishments for the sake of his resume. I don't want you to give me credit because you're mad that I'm mad. I want you to give me credit because you think I worked hard for it and I deserve it. You don't deserve it. You're a baby. Oh, and what about the time he reports Richard's alcoholism to the hospital board and won't admit it's in part because he wants his friend's job? What, do you want to take notes so you can show it to the board so they can offer you his job? Admit you want to be chief. All right, you know what? I'm done having this argument. He has a black and white worldview. Rather than totally judging Derek's bad behavior, it's more productive to look at how many of his issues can be traced back to trauma. Witnessing his father's murder led him to develop a belief that everything and everyone is fixed as either right or wrong. How is it that you don't know the difference between right and wrong? Because I don't think that things are simply right or wrong. We can feel for Derek and understand how his painful backstory has shaped him, while also recognizing that his black and white view of the world is pretty unhealthy. His refusal to allow for any middle ground makes him tough on his loved ones. You don't give people any room. Flaws are unacceptable to McDreamy. Don't make Most of all, his rigid outlook and impossibly high standards are detrimental to his own mental health. He's devastated when he learns about the mortality rate of his patients, but his black and white brain won't consider that these numbers don't take into account that he's the only surgeon willing to take a chance on near-death patients. By removing the nuance from the situation and being unable to forgive himself, he can see only failure. These are the people I saved. These are the people I killed. You're not looking at the big picture. His judgmental mindset can also make him cruel. When he's repulsed by the idea that he could have any shared humanity with a killer, he doesn't behave empathetically and ethically as a physician. It's inhumane. No, killing people is inhumane. Denying and paying killers is a judgment call. He's not facing his anger or feelings. Derek isn't a hothead like some other doctors on the show, but beneath that cool, restrained demeanor is a quieter, bottled up rage. He's never resolved his feelings of anger towards his father's killer. I know how angry you still are about what happened to dad. Of course I'm angry. And a lot of Derek's problems stem from unwillingness or inability to explore and express emotion. 
Derek can undoubtedly be sweet, and he comes across like a big romantic who opens up the dark and twisty Meredith to the possibilities of love. I can't believe we're doing this. It's, it's Valentine's Day. We, we don't, don't do Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. It's romantic. But like an idealistic knight in shining armor, he prefers grand, sweeping gestures, even sometimes ones that can be termed love bombing, instead of dealing with underlying issues. Well, so talk. yesterday you're making out with scrub nurses, and today you're building our dream house. Yes. He doesn't know how to support people who are going through anything messy, like when Meredith is struggling with depression. Being closed off to emotional complexity can lead to him mistreating people he actually loves, and his inability to express his anger in a healthy way manifests in lashing out. Get out. Like when he's so upset at his own perceived failures as a surgeon that he angrily projects his shame onto Meredith. There's no fixing you. You're a lemon. And bats the engagement ring meant for her into the woods. Other times, he uses risky behavior to cope with feeling out of control, getting arrested multiple times. Your lady looks pissed. Again, Derek? His impulsive behavior masks some severe insecurities that Derek has failed to deal with. He refuses to grow. Ultimately, Derek's biggest problem is his lack of growth. Sure, everyone is flawed, and just because Derek has toxic traits doesn't mean we can't relate to him and his flaws, but he's unwilling to undergo the necessary self-reflection to make progress. Still running in circles around all the women in your life. I'm not running around in circles. Instead of admitting when he's wrong and learning from it, he's more likely to get mad at anyone who questions his judgment or authority. You don't want to get into who's responsible for all of this. His lack of character development is highlighted by other members of the cast who arguably start off as more problematic than Derek but evolve and improve. His best friend Mark is originally introduced as a destructive womanizer before growing into a loving person and an empathetic father. In stark contrast to this transformation, Derek begins the series as the hospital heartthrob, but by the end is being viewed by audiences in a far more critical light. You can't just drag us away so I can come live in your shadow. It's called a trailing this spouse. This is not like that. This is exactly that, and it's not what I signed up for. Fans were truly devastated after Derek's death. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> with some even claiming that the show jumped the shark after his departure, given he occupied an irreplaceable role in Meredith's heart. I had one great love in my life, and he died. But with Derek gone, the show had opportunities to give valuable airtime to other characters more willing to grow. Greg Bryan of Cheat Sheet argues that the show was smart to make Derek's death final, as it allowed room for other storylines to blossom, particularly ones centered on female characters. He uses his perfect man facade as an excuse not to be better. Yes, on the surface, McDreamy seems like the perfect guy, a handsome doctor who dedicates his life to advancing the field of neurosurgery, whose compassion for patients and devotion to saving lives is unparalleled. It's a beautiful day to save lives. But ultimately, he used those amazing strengths to mask and excuse not addressing some very big personal weaknesses and pathologies. So Derek's a reminder to us that no one is above that crucial work of self-reflection and growth. Meanwhile, we may just be better off allowing McDreamy to stay in Meredith's dreams. I mean, you think you're charming and that talented, neurotic, overly moose hair sort of way good for you. This is The Take. Let's take the tropes home with us. We are so excited to announce that we now have a line of Weird Girl merchandise. It's not just a question of, am I the weird girl? You have to ask yourself, which weird girl am I? Are you the dreamy space cadet living on your own planet? Are you the delightfully spiraling basket case? Are you the ferocious goth? Are you the awkward misfit? Are you the smartass? I think there's power in owning the weird girl in all of us. You can now express it through posters, mugs, a backpack, t-shirts. Wear it on your sleeve. Announce that you are the weird girl. We had so much fun conceptualizing these characters and drawing from our favorite weird girls of film and TV to create our vision of the five types. One of our favorite designs is this beautiful line art rendering of the weird girl. She's got the iconic goth visual. It just looks great whether you're doing a cute backpack, a hoodie, you can grab a tote or a poster with all of the weird girls. Or another approach is to mix and match. So you grab your space cadet water bottle, your misfit hoodie, and your basket case poster behind you. I love these shirts. It's also super soft. I really, it's very soft. I really yeah. feel like I could it's live really in this. Quite lovely. Like, click the link in the description below to order from Spring right now. To the weird girl. To the weird girls in all of us. Which weird girl are you?